Hello, hello. Happy Wednesday. All right, so we got some people joining in. Good morning. All right, so I'm just gonna jump right in and then people can join as they please. So today we're gonna be talking about orthophosphate, um, which I know sounds like a really boring scientific term, um, but it's actually really important to drinking water in the United States specifically. Um, so what is orthophosphate? Um, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Annalise. I'm Hyde Reeves Head of Policy, sorry. So what is orthophosphate? What is this crazy sounding name? What is it used for? So orthophosphate is an additive that municipal water systems will put in the water to help combat corrosion of lead pipes. So that's kind of the short story. Uh, but orthophosphate has a long history, as well as um, lead pipes in the US. Uh, so I have some really interesting little factoids and yeah, we'll just, we'll jump right into kind of the history and the timeline and, and why the US has so many lead pipes <laughs> still, in, still in the ground. So, you know, why was lead such a desirable metal? Number one, it was very, very cheap. Um, so that means that municipalities could purchase lead at a really low cost and um, just basically scatter it all over the city. So the second reason is that it's super malleable. Um, and that was great in forming the lead pipes, but then also in kind of organizing the infrastructure around existing buildings. Um, and it was easy to just kind of lay and and adjust and form into the shape that was desired at the time. So while this is all good, it's cheap, it's easy to form, it's easy to use. Um, we now know that lead is a neurotoxin, um, that it can cause long-term irreversible damages to uh, brain development in young children. Um, so not, and as well as just lead poisoning in adults. So the year is 1900 and about 70% of cities in the US have lead water lines. So, so they're really just, they're all in on lead. Um, however, the cities that had lead service lines and lead water lines were finding higher incidences of lead poisoning than cities without. So because of this, in the 1920s, a bunch of advocacy groups were forming um, and they were starting to make the connection between these high levels of lead poisoning um, or just developmental issues and exposure to lead in pipes. So unfortunately, these advocacy groups, as we see all the time, even in 2021, were silenced by lobbying groups, particularly uh, one big one, Lead Industries Association, which actually existed until the 1970s. And their biggest accomplishment was um, keeping lead, you know, a, a commodity, a valuable commodity until the 1970s. So for that period of time, 1920 to 1970s, 1970, these advocacy groups were silenced and lead continued to be superior. Um, so we've known about these health issues for so long. And even in the 1920s, advocacy groups were, were ringing the alarm. They were trying to um, tell the government that lead was really, really harmful. So this is not new. Our, our knowledge of lead pipes is certainly not, not new. So we're kind of, we're at a crossroads here. Um, so we can't replace every single lead pipe in the US. I mean, like, 
I can't even imagine that like that engineering project you'd have to dig up streets and and it would it would take decades um it would also it's also just unrealistic um especially like cities like Pittsburgh and Boston where almost the entire city has lead water lines um so I don't even know how I don't even know how engineers would go about <clears throat> fixing that so some cities acknowledged that the problem was worse if the water was acidic. Um, so this is when municipalities kind of started to play around with altering the pH. Um, so obviously the more acidic the water, the more likely corrosion is going to happen in the inner layers of these lead pipes. Um, so not many people actually know this, but in 2001, Washington, D.C., um, had a lead crisis that was kind of similar, not, not the same scale as Flint, but a similar crisis to what happened in Flint. Um, so thousands of children were exposed to lead levels that were actually 83 times higher than the federal limit. So, you know, it's 2001 and we're still dealing with the lead crisis. We're still trying to figure out how to address lead pipes in 2001. Um, so scientists kind of worked quickly to figure out a solution, um, and this is kind of where the story of orthophosphate begins. So Washington, D.C. was really the first case study of orthophosphate um, not only working, but, you know, being really, really successful for the most part. Um, so as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, orthophosphate is a common corrosion control inhibitor. Um, and it's used by a handful of water, of large water suppliers um, throughout the U.S. And so when it's added to the source water, as it's going through the treatment process, it reacts with lead when it touches the lead pipes and creates this mineral-like crust on the inside of the lead pipes that prevents the lead from then leaching into the water as it kind of navigates to someone's tap. So... Yeah, it kind of, it's just basically like a coating on the inside of the pipes, and it's like this white mineral crust. Um, so yeah, DC was case study number one, um, which is really wild because a lot of cities didn't learn from DC's mistake, or I guess um, DC's kind of initial like lead crisis, which is pretty fascinating because... Um, Flint happened, you know, not too many years after, um, and they, you know, Flint could have learned their lesson from D.C., but unfortunately, city officials were trying to cut corners, and uh, orthophosphate's not expensive, but it's definitely an additional cost to taxpayers. Um, so, yeah, like, I'll just kind of talk about Flint and what they could have done and how they could have utilized orthophosphate. Um, so when Flint switched their source water, the new source water was actually more acidic, which led to higher levels of corrosion. Um, so instead of create or instead of addressing the pH or even adding orthophosphate or any other corrosion control inhibitor, um, they just kind of continued the state the same water treatment as the original source water, but that water chemistry unfortunately changed. So, um, you know, orthophosphate is definitely a useful tool, but it it's somewhat of a band-aid um, because the lead is still very much present in the water lines and pipes, and uh, it's not, it doesn't really entirely mitigate the problem. Um, so another thing, another kind of nuance with orthophosphate is that if you are planning to replace, you know, lead service lines or the any sort of lead plumbing or whatever, if the city is trying to replace lead lines, um, it can actually disrupt that orthophosphate layer. Um, and that can just expose lead into the back into the water system, back into the water pipes, um, and a lot of people don't even know that this happens. So that's definitely something to be aware of. And people or scientists and research have determined that after 
lead service lines or after lead pipes are replaced, that you can expect to see lead levels increase for a couple of months. Um, so you'll need, you'll need to definitely take that into consideration. Um, and then another thing, I just, I think it's kind of funny that Hydroview's approach to water filtration is very much the same as how municipalities um, should, should go about determining uh, how to mitigate lead levels. So not every city's water is the same. Like chemistry of water is different across the country. We know that at Hydroview. So just determining, okay, orthophosphate is gonna, it's gonna protect everyone, it's gonna fix lead levels, that might not be the case. There are a lot of things that go into um, the viability of orthophosphate in drinking water. So yeah, and another point is that orthophosphate can take up to six months to work. So it can take up to six months to create that protective layer on the inside of pipes. Um, so yeah, orthophosphate, not one size fits all. Um, there are a lot of nuances to it being able to work. Again, some cities don't wanna pay um, for orthophosphate. Flint, you know, obviously one of the worst water cris crises we've seen in the country, but it's, you know, if they were to add orthophosphate, would less children have been exposed to lead? Probably. Um, and so that's just, that's just a reality of the situation. But there are a lot of things that need to uh, be considered when determining ortho if orthophosphate can be an actual solution. Um, same with adjusting the pH. So these are kind of two tools used to mitigate lead that can work in conjunction with each other. Um, and it's really up to municipal water providers and making sure that they understand best practices and um, have the funding to maintain orthophosphate because then, you know, if you stop, that corrosion layer over time will degrade and then you'll be back at square one with the lead levels. Um, so, yeah, I hope that this kind of uh, helped people to understand that it's really complex, the lead crisis in the U.S., um, and it's been around for so long, and we're still not really, we still haven't really figured out how to fix it at the municipal level. Obviously, you know, hopefully by understanding this, you'll understand that it's really up to the consumer um, to determine the situation of your water. Like if it, you know, if you need a water filter or whatever that might look like, it's always good to reach out to elected officials, city officials, and just kind of try to understand what, what they're doing in terms of um, protecting the constituents from lead. And of course, uh, consumer confidence reports are available for almost every city in the country, hopefully every city in the country. Um, and you can look at what type of corrosion control methods uh, your municipality is using. And if you need help determining that, you can always reach out to um, one of our water nerds. So if you go to howtoreview.com, you can use our live chat at the bottom, and we'll, we'd be happy to uh, look at what kind of corrosion control inhibit inhibitor your municipality is using and your lead levels and any other, any other questions you have about water quality. Um, so you can email, also email hello at hydroviv.com if you have any questions as well. And yeah, I hope that this was informative. Um, and yeah. Oh, we have some comments. <laughs> Sorry. Let's just see what else we got on here. Okay, so someone asked about Drano on pipes. That's a really good question. Um, I will try to figure out the answer to that and then send you a DM. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would, that would definitely be something to consider because Drano is extremely acidic. So yeah, that's a really good question. Um, all right, so I'm going to end this here, but I hope everyone has a really, really good Wednesday. And I will see you next week. All right. Bye-bye.